right, good morning, good morning. We're going to grab our Bibles, we're going to dig in. If you take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 this morning. If you are visiting with us, we have been in a series. To me, it's been a very intriguing series to prepare because we're looking at the Christmas story through the eyes of an individual that does not know Jesus. We're looking at the story of the birth of Jesus as it seems almost, almost like a crime scene. Now, you and I, as we've come to know Jesus, we would say, how, how could you say that the birth of Jesus is a crime scene? Well, if the Lord Jesus has touched your life, it's not a crime scene. But if you look, look at the birth of Jesus through the eyes of somebody that does not know the story or walks with a, with a rational mind that wants to understand, it doesn't make sense. So thus we have CSI Jerusalem. The first week we were together, we looked at the, the crime scene that, that it's illegitimate to think that a woman could get pregnant without any physical relationship with a man. And last week we looked at the idea of, of a crime scene and the illegality of that because here you have someone who claims to be the Lord of all and that defies the laws that I've written in my own heart. In my own heart, I say, I'm the boss. And now he comes along and says, he's the boss? And today, today we look at a whole different crime scene. But let me read to you out of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, so that I can set the stage for you. Here's what it says. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Let's pray. Father, would it be that today, that, Lord, those who are listening online or even here with us right now, if there has ever been any hindrance in our lives to knowing the truth of why you came, that that would be washed away today. If there's any hindrance, any confusion, any doubt, that we would come to the place where we would, we would no longer say that, Lord, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense, I can't cross that threshold, I won't believe in you, it's illogical. Lord, that today we would say it's not logical, but it's truth. Holy Spirit, you're the only one that woos men to a saving relationship with Jesus, so I ask that you do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we have a crime, a crime against reason, and we have a crime against science. He, Jesus, came to be ruler over the entire universe. All creation declares Jesus, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, declares Jesus as father over all for all eternity. Then why did he come as a man? You ever thought about that? Why did Jesus... Now understand, I'm speaking to you as though I'm speaking to speaking as somebody from a humanistic standpoint, somebody that's asking questions about why did Jesus do it this way? Why did God do it this way? Those of us who are on the other side of that threshold who have accepted Christ, we understand more fully. So I have a three-part crime scene that I want to describe to you this morning. There There are some things that do not make sense to us as human beings. Number one is we have an illogical announcement. Number two, we have, we have an illogical existence. And number three, we have an illogical grace. An illogical grace. So let me start with the first. Because we have an announcement. 
In the announcement, if you remember, we've talked about this for several weeks. Here's an announcement. At the birth of Jesus Christ, the angels show up and, and the angels declare to numerous people that, that Jesus, the king of the Jews, is, is born. And we understand that if what Isaiah says is true, and let me remind you what Isaiah says, in 9.6, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, who, who would ever make as grand a statement as that and then show up so poor that he can't even afford a bed? He was born in a stable. From a humanistic standpoint, I want you to look at this with me because we have a ministry here. It's called First Impressions. And what's the whole purpose behind our First Impressions ministry? If you're new to South Bay, you had your hand shaked when you walked in. If you, if you came up to the Welcome Center and you wanted to figure out who we are and what we do, somebody put something in your hand and said, here, why do we do that? We want you to know who we are. We want you to know that we love you. We want you to see that we're friendly people, that we don't bite. Most of us don't bite. <laughs> A couple of us don't bite, okay? No, I'm just kidding. You know why? PR is important. PR is very critical in our world today. We have even people who have jobs who create PR, public relations presence, for people so that they can succeed. My question to you, from a, from a humanistic standpoint, when you look inside of a stable, when you smell the smell of animals, when you see a feeding trough, and the king of the Jews in the feeding trough, does that speak to you as king of the Jews? From a humanistic standpoint, you can say, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. From a public relations standpoint, that is a nightmare. Do you understand what I'm saying? You would, you would think that there would, be, there would be something different. This is an illogical way that God would choose to introduce himself to the world. If I'm trying to get people to believe me, I, I would have done it completely different. And maybe you would have too. I think we can dig into the announcement. And we could dig into the way that, that Jesus came into this world. And we, we, we could, from a, from a fleshly, humanistic standpoint, we could point holes in it saying, you didn't do it right. You didn't do it right. You know, perhaps... God had reasons why he sent his son to earth the way he did. Do you think? <laughs> Perhaps the biggest conclusion here is that God likes to do miracles in a, in a spectacular way. And maybe God has no care whatsoever for public relations. That's not even how he thinks. Maybe he's more concerned with the human heart. And none of it makes sense to the rational mind. We know that God moves in mysterious ways. And many times he comes in a way into our lives. He shows up in our lives. And he shows up into this world in a way to show the world that he, he shows up in the ways that we don't expect for him to show up. And I think he likes that. See, I think God is much bigger, much, much bigger than, than our comprehension. And I think God plans it that way. But what if God did do things based upon our comprehension, based upon our rational mind? Well, I think then that we would be able to boast about it. We would be able to say, ha I had you figured out all along. Now, we like to say that to people around us, but has there ever been anybody on earth who could say that about God? No. Nobody has him figured out. Nobody. You know, we can try. Perhaps his lowly birth removes the human advantage. Perhaps he didn't choose to be born into some line of royalty because then forever, as some do today, they would say he was born into this line, therefore this is the most important government or this is the most important religion. Nobody can make claim to the birth of Jesus Christ as theirs because it doesn't belong to anybody, it belongs to everybody. 
Jesus chose the perfect way. The perfect way. Perhaps God was trying to show to man his, his, his heart, his humble spirit. Ultimately, only, only God knows. And maybe someday when we get there, he'll explain to us why he did things the way he did in the announcement, this illogical announcement. Which brings up the second point that I want to bring to you, and that is the, the illogical existence. The illogical existence. You see, the idea that God, the God of the universe, and I'm going to dispel that in just a second because it's so much more than the God of the universe, but let me just, for the sake of saying, the God of the universe would come to earth and live like a man is illogical. It really is illogical from a human standpoint because the, the creator of the universe, here's, here's what I mean. The scripture tells us that the heavens at some point in time are going to be rolled up like a scroll. That is, every star, you know it takes thousands of years for us to even know that stars are there because all we're getting is the light. The stars, in most cases, probably have burnt out a long time ago, right? That's what science says today. So it takes this length of time for the light of the star to just get to us. So the thing is, those stars, God flicked them like a big lighter, turned them on. And he's going to turn them off with the lift of his thumb. He's going to roll up everything that we don't even understand, which means then that there is this realm, our scientists today said, the universe, it just keeps expanding. No, it doesn't. The universe is held in the hand of God, and someday God's going to go, I'm done with the universe, and he's going to squeeze it like a piece of paper, because literally that's what he sees it as, as a piece of paper. All the existence that you know today is like a piece of paper in my hand, and someday I'm going to roll it up which means there's an existence of our God so far beyond the universe. Now, understand God who holds the universe in his hand became a six-foot-tall man. That's illogical. From a humanistic standpoint, that doesn't make any sense. You would think that he would come to earth, at, at the least he would be like King Solomon or, or uh, uh, just a, a wise king and rule and turn the ship and make it go right. Or maybe he would have come like Samson and he would have just kicked everybody's butt. <laughs> Made it right. But he didn't. He came as a lowly carpenter born in a stinky stable, laying in closed, used, closed, I'm sure, lying in a little manger. I've heard this statement before, and maybe you've heard this too. God created man in his own image, and, and ever since then, man has been attempting to return the favor. God defined himself to us, and once we figure out who we are, we then turn around and say, God, we'd really like to define you. I want to believe the way I believe so that I can live the way I want to live. <laughs> Some people are more comfortable with alternate religions. They, they, the, 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 the illogical nature of God becoming a man doesn't make sense to them can't do that. I'm going to go find a different religion, they say. But you see, the, the, the struggle there is with the logic. The struggle there was the, is with the rational mind. But the beauty of our God, the beauty of how he relates to us is that we, we our, our scientific minds, our elucidations don't take us to the point of salvation they never have and they never will at some point in time we have to we have to rely upon here's the big word faith faith at some point in time i have to admit that my understanding the 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 illogical nature of all that i see and all that i know is is a hindrance to me it's not a help you see, the beauty of what God does in Jesus Christ is that he unapologetically comes in an unexpected way. And only God would do that. 
If it were up to us, we would have billboards and signs and PR. We would dress right, sound right, look right. We would fit in. We would make meetings with mayors and, and, and city officials and presidents and kings. And we would want who we are to... No, God did it in such an illogical way. The fact is, he does not need our permission. Yeah. And, and he's not really interested in our plan at all. He's not. He comes to this world in such a way it demands faith. It demands faith. God makes faith necessary in the way that he came to this earth. He does not desire by one inch to convince you. He does not want to change your irrational mind to become rational so that you can accept him. God is perfectly comfortable being unreasonable. But, 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 pastor, if God is not reasonable, how am I to accept him? You see, your understanding is not what brings you to Christ Jesus. Your logic and putting things together in the right place is not what brings you to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not. You see, understanding that, that logic and reason follows faith. It follows faith. And until you get to a place in your life where you need the most illogical thing that you could ever imagine from a humanistic standpoint to save you, you won't know salvation. You won't know it. It's his plan. Which leads me to the last area. What I call illogical grace. Illogical grace. We know salvation comes through grace. To me, this seems to be the biggest crime scene of all. This is the hardest one for people. When they arrive at the crime scene, they, they look at this and they go, you know what, I, I, can, I, can, I can appreciate illegitimacy. I can appreciate the illegality issues that we've talked about, but, but the illogical grace that I'm confronted with doesn't make any sense. Here's how I walk with that personally. I know that this world is a sinful world. I know it is. And, and you know, if I asked you the question, how, how would you define your worst enemy? Who, who's your worst enemy? I mean, I could go down the list, you know, and I could talk about um, people in my life, right, that have been my worst nightmare. But I, 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 you have to know that the person who's sitting at the top of the list is me. My worst nightmare is me. Do you ever feel like that? My worst nightmare is me. I'm confronted with my mistakes. They're always there. There's, there's, there's problems and issues in my life, just like you have problems and issues in your life, and we're always working on it. And it feels good sometimes to pin those on other people because I feel like I get a reprieve, but it's not very long before they come back. I know that I'm sinful. And sometimes I ask God this question. I say two questions, really. Why, God, do you put up with me? And God, how can you possibly use a person like me? Do you ever ask those questions to God? Sure you do. But guess what? God does put up with me. And God does use me. In the same way that God puts up with you and God uses you. God not only puts up with me, God loves me. God has accepted me for who I am. God is transforming me as days turn into weeks and weeks into months and months into years. God has accepted me. He holds on to me just the same way he holds on to you. He latches on to you through the blood of his son Jesus Christ and he holds you. No matter what you think, no matter what you do, he loves you and he holds you. Not only does he like you, he loves you. And he uses you too if you'll allow him. 
because of this gift of grace, he uses you. Now, some of you are thinking, yeah, he uses me. And, and here's how you feel. Tell me if I'm accurate here. Uh, you have a pair of shoes in your closet that you bought. And you've never even worn these shoes. They're in your closet because you bought them. And because you bought them, you're not going to throw them away. But you've never in your life had an occasion to wear those shoes. You, you pull open the closet door, you look, and you go, not today. Right? And some of you feel like that's how God feels about you. I bought you at the cross, but you kind of remind me of a duckbill platypus. I have no idea what it does and why it even exists. It defies creation. And that's how you feel. You're not a pair of shoes that sit in, sits in God's closet and he's trying to figure out what to do with them, when he could actually wear them. You're more like, you're like an old sweater that the Father puts on on a cold day. You ever put that sweater on? I know we're in Florida, just, just walk with me here, okay? <laughs> You ever put that sweater on and you just know it's going to be a good day? I've got the sweater on. This is my sweater. Some of you, I'm, I'm completely losing you because you don't wear sweaters. Let me say it this way. Some of you have a wig in your closet. Okay? <laughs> uh, that's probably hitting home better. Or a toupee, all right? A sweater. Some of you, it's your Superman underwear. I know it is. I'm completely going off track here. I'm so sorry. But, but do you understand, do you understand how God made you, he, he, not only do you wrap yourself in him, he wraps himself in you, he loves you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you understand the illogical nature of that? Who, who would do that? God looked at my life, God looked at your life, and he took me off the hook. And he put his son on the hook. And when that begins to settle in, there's a natural response given our humanity that we begin to say, I receive it, but I feel like I need to do something with it. I've, I've got to do something about this. I've got to do something for God. Surely I must do good works to make up for all the wrong things that I've done. I, I, should, I should give all I have to the poor, and I will be at church every Sunday. As a matter of fact, every time the doors are open, I'm going to be there. I'm going to live a good life. I'm going to, and what we're trying to do is we're, we're saying, surely, surely I've got to prove my savableness. I just made a new word. Savableness. And that's how many of us walk this earth. I have to prove my savableness. Is that you? Is that where you are? Oh, friends, the crime scene is just emerging out of the last three weeks right here. And I don't want you to miss it. This is the, this is the worst crime. This is the worst Sorrow. This is the, 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 the illogical nature of what I'm sharing with you. The crime of illegitimacy bears nothing on this. The, the crime of illegality bears nothing on this. This is the hardest crime to take, and that is the illogical truth of grace is offered to you, and you can't earn it. You can't. There's nothing that you can do in this life, as good as you are, to ever earn the gift of grace because you don't earn gifts. You don't earn gifts. It's just like at, at Christmas time when we give and receive gifts. God gave to us a gift, and this gift is grace. Salvation is a gift from God, it's not earned. Men's gifts, we often do not give gifts to the un earned or the undeserving we, we we don't do that we we have a tendency to give to people that we love who have blessed us but but understand 
that God's given you a gift if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And if you're not, please pay careful attention to what I'm saying. God has laid a gift in front of you. He's given to you a gift. And, and it's, it's almost as though you would say, if you feel like you can earn your salvation, it's almost, you would say, look how I stuck my arm out to receive that gift. And, and look how my fingers stretched out in such a magnanimous way to receive the gift. Look how I'm bent over with knees and thighs flexed to receive the gift. The scripture tells us no one can boast because it's a gift. We didn't earn it. It's unearned. Our salvation is a gift. From beginning to end, God's the giver, we're the receiver. Salvation is to those who would receive a gift, not because of the great things that we think we can or cannot do. Now, let me, let me flip this coin because this crime scene literally has two sides to it. The first side is the fact that it is unearned. Unearned. The gift of grace unearned but when you introduce the word grace there the gift of grace grace indicates something else equally as important that is so critical to understand and that is not only is it unearned it's undeserved it's undeserved now i know i rub shoulders with you and i know some of you and you are squeaky clean you are good people, as good as they get. But in all of your goodness, you do not deserve the gift that God has given. None of us do. Picture it this way. Picture, picture a, a beggar on the side of the road. Let's all be beggars for just a second. On the side of the road, and a man comes up and you say, Sir, can I just have a drink of water? The man's drinking a, a uh, Dasani water. And the man says, Absolutely. He gives us the water. And then he says, I've got something else for you. And he writes you a check for every last penny in his bank account. It's $7 million. He writes you a check. And you say, all I was asking for was water. I don't, I don't deserve this. Why would you give up everything? You don't even know me. I was simply wanting water to get from point A to point B. You've changed my life. We're all beggars. We're all beggars. We're, we're all just looking for water. And we got the water, but we got so much more. So much more. Theological nature of what God has done. From the human mind, it makes no sense. But once you know Jesus, once you know him, and you begin to understand the love he has, it's too big a gift for us to receive, but it's not too big a gift for him to give because of his heart, because of who he is. Did you know that salvation has never occurred on this earth in the life of a person who deserved it? Ever. There's never been a man or a woman on this earth who got saved because they deserved it all of our sinfulness and all of our rebellion, God pardons us through Jesus Christ. It is unearned and it is undeserved. And I thank God for that. And when we celebrate at Christmas time, we're considering in our mind, we're celebrating the fact that it is unearned and it is undeserved, but God gave it anyway because of his great love. His great love for you. So, in finishing out this, this series on uh, Jerusalem CSI, crime scene investigation, and, and frankly, it turns, it turns from a crime scene into something different. Our greatest crime scene reveals really great grace, great grace. We've been given great grace by God himself who sent his son to die. 
And one, one question remains, and that is, have you received the, the most unearned and undeserved gift you could ever imagine? God's grace. Would you close your eyes? Just bow your heads. Have you, have you been trying to earn your salvation? Are you tired yet? God, God loves you. And he wants you to be free in him, in, in his son Jesus Christ. He, he wants you to just freely admit today, Lord, I can't earn it and I don't deserve it. But I receive it because it's a gift, a gift given to me by you. See, I believe there are some of you who you've been working so hard to be a good person and you believe that you are savable if you're a good person. And I want to tell you that's a crime scene. That's a crime scene. And you can walk away from that crime scene this morning and you can walk into the, the beautiful, beautiful environment of the Lord Jesus Christ where he looks at you and says, I accept you right where you are, right where you are. I, I declare that you are free. Your sins forgiven. Your life abundant. My power will be manifest in you. I'm going to bless you. And you don't have to earn it. And you certainly don't deserve it. But all you need to do is receive it. So this morning, would you receive it? simply say, Lord, I receive your free gift. I receive it right now. If you just said that prayer, would you put up your hand so that I can see? Pastor David, I just received. I just received God's free gift. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. He gave it to me. Hallelujah, I see your hand. Is there anybody else who would say, I'm accepting God's free gift of salvation today. Anybody else? You know, our elders and pastors are going to be up at the front here at the close of the service. We are always wanting to pray with you and we do pray for you those of you who have lifted your hands today we're going to put a little book in your hand it talks a little bit about the decision that you just made we would love to pray with you down front so as the service closes would you make your way down front so that we can minister to you and no matter what your issues are no matter what's heavy on your heart especially this time of year maybe you could you could feel encouraged by an arm that's wrapped around you this morning an arm of love. Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for what this season means. I thank you for the kindness that you have shown to us, the grace and the mercy that has come through Jesus. We have received a gift so illogical from a human standpoint, but so needed. Thank you. We didn't earn it. And we don't deserve it. But we have it because of your goodness to us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done for us. And all God's people said, amen. I am so looking forward to being with you guys on Christmas Eve. And remember, if you'd like to come forward for prayer, we'll be here for you. God bless you. And the service is dismissed.